In this video, I will talk about multithreading and how multithreading works in Python. So, uh, yeah, first of all, I want to talk about why you would want to use multithreading over multiprocessing. Um, and even in a language like Python, where multithreading isn't really parallel, um, yeah, in some cases, it makes sense to use multithreading instead of multiprocessing. Um, yeah, so first of all, the process which you use in multiprocessing uh, contains lots of information and it's more than just like a bit of code and maybe some memory. Um, the computer has a lot of information stored about each process and um, yeah, when switching between different processes there's a lot of overhead that you have to consider. Uh, like yeah, they're written down and we have to, I've written down some examples here of what um, the computer has to keep track of uh, like the state of the process, if it's currently running or if it's ready to run, if it's inactive, um, then the program counter. So, yeah, basically in which line of the assembly code is um, yeah is the program right now. Um, so, which is the next command the CPU has to execute. Then the CPU registers, uh, which maybe also have cache and... Um, yeah, what values are in like the actual physical um, chips inside the CPU and um, what is stored in the cache. Then scheduling information, um, what is the priority of this process, um, how, like, how important is it that this gets executed soon, uh, what is the position in, in like an execution queue. Uh, there are lots of information um, about a process that the computer needs to keep track of and whenever it's switching between two, uh, two processes then it has to store all this information somewhere in memory and when it keep, uh, when it goes back to this process it has to load all of that back um, yeah, into the CPU, into the cache and yeah, this is just a lot of overhead because it has to do a lot of loading and unloading of the CPU and um, yeah, all of these CPU cycles could be used to do some uh, calculations, but if it's just occupied with loading and unloading data, uh, yeah, then you lose a lot of like execution time. So um, yeah, you don't have this problem in multithreading because multithreading is just inside one process, and there the CPU doesn't have to uh, like yeah change the cache doesn't really have to reset all the registers doesn't have to um yeah load the state from uh, some other time uh, where the process ran this is already all uh, this is all already there it can just um yeah basically do a jump in the program counter and execute a different part of code so this is very fast and efficient and therefore threads like have less overhead than multiprocessing um, so switching between processes. And additionally, threads also have um, a shared storage. So um, caching can get more efficient because the CPU has a cache in which it stores um, like values that it uses quite often. And uh, this cache is much quicker than the actual memory. And um, yeah, in the same process, it can use this cache more efficiently and therefore also run faster um, than when switching between uh, processes a lot of times. And um, yeah, then we have a list down here of some more advantages and disadvantages of threads. And um, yeah, I will just go through them and explain those uh, that I think need explaining. And um, yeah, I've talked about some of them already. So uh, yeah, the, the creation and the task switching is faster. I've explained this already. Um, the creation is faster because um, yeah, you don't really have to create a new, uh, a new process and you don't have to create all this information for a new process. You can just um, create a new lightweight thread, um, yeah, which then just runs different parts of the code. Um, you have efficient commu communication between threads. Uh, this is because they have uh, they have shared memory, and different threads can work on the same part of memory. Whereas in processes, you have um, different parts of memory associated with each process, 
and it gets really difficult to have communication between them because the operating system will not allow different processes to write to memory that they don't own uh, because this would be like, dangerous and it would be a security risk, uh, risk if any process could just write anything in your memory uh, that would not be good and um, yeah the operating system also doesn't schedule the threads so you have to create your own um, scheduling and this can mean that uh, you can tailor it to your application and you can make it much more efficient than the general um, scheduling in uh, yeah in the operating system but then this also is a disadvantage so you don't um, uh, yeah the operating system doesn't schedule them so um, yeah, you have to do that on your own and uh, it might be harder in some cases to synchronize threads um, because you have to deal with locks and uh, mutexes for example on, um, on your own. Then also processes are better isolated than threads. I've also talked about this. The processes have their own part of memory um, and basically their own code, their own everything that a process has. Um, so they are basically their own program and um, yeah then a crashing thread means uh, that the program will crash and uh, this is because uh, yeah a crash in one thread means that basically there was a crash in the whole program so this is the view for the operating system and the oper operating system will then say um, yeah this crash this program uh, I will remove it and um, this doesn't have to be the case with crashing uh, processes. So you have, if you have a multi-processed uh, application, then one process might fail and crash. Uh, but yeah, the main yeah process could just restart that process and could just uh, continue running, and uh, it's not as fatal as a crashing thread. But of course, you can also get around this by doing error handling and just making sure that threads never crash. But never is a strong word and yeah, you can't ever find every bug, I guess. And uh, yeah, I guess the biggest disadvantage for threads, at least in Python, is that they are not really parallel and they don't leverage the um, multiprocessing power of modern CPUs. So uh, this is why we will talk about both threads and um, yeah, also multiprocessing. All right, so let's get to some examples. For multi-threading, first of all, we can use the threading module and more specifically the thread object uh, or the thread class in this threading uh, module. And um, yeah, we can use this to create thread objects, which then run uh, next to our main thread. So when you run a Python program, you always have one thread already. This is called the main thread. And this is just um, yeah, the, the thread um, that executes all of your code uh, that you write in the in the file or in a Jupyter Notebook as well, for example. And um, yeah, you can now create another thread and then they will run um, concurrently so it might look like they are running in parallel, but just keep in mind that in Python, the threads are not running in parallel. Okay, so how do we create such a thread? Um, we call the thread constructor and we have to specify a target function. And in this case, I just um, specified this hello function and this is just going to print um, hello and um, say a name and then sleep for one second. And um, yeah, then you can also specify the arcs uh, parameter here. And this is a tuple where you can um, specify which parameters should be passed to this target function, in this case, the hello function. And you would just specify one name. Then we can also specify the name of the thread. And here I just set the name to the Steve the friendly thread because it says hello. And um, this is just internally the name for this thread. And uh, you can also use this name to then afterwards index um, the threads of your program uh, using the threading module. Um, but you don't really have to set this. So this is optional. You can also leave it as blank. And then uh, yeah, a name will be generated um, 
using some ID, I guess. And then lastly, you can also specify that if this thread should be a daemon thread. And daemon threads are threads that um, yeah will be killed as soon as no other non-daemon thread is alive for one process. So um, this basically means that um, as soon as all threads that are not demons are finished, then uh, the threads that are demons will just be removed. So they can't really keep the process alive. And as soon as uh, the main thread and all other um, non-demon threads have finished, they will also be removed. And this can be useful um, in some cases where, for example, you want to um, just like a quick example where you want to tell a server that you're um, still running a program but um, you don't want to do that on the main thread because you want to do some calculations on the main thread and you don't want that to be interrupted like in a, a constant interval so you said um, you create a new thread uh, make this a daemon thread and this will then talk to a server uh, once and again and tell the, the server that you're still there but if your main thread finishes or crashes or whatever, you don't want your program to continue running and telling the server that you're still there because the main part of the program has yeah has finished or um, has crashed. And then you can set the this server thread to a daemon and um, yeah, it will just be removed as soon as the main thread, so the non-daemon thread, um, finishes. Okay, so... Um, yeah, now we've created such a thread object and this didn't really do anything yet. So if we create this, it says here the thread object um, has a name and it's um, a daemon. But um, yeah, it didn't execute the function yet. So how do we start this thread? Well, using the start method. And uh, we can just call thread.start and this will then run our thread and um, execute our function here in a new thread. And uh, you will see that um, this will print something, this will start printing something, will print 20 things and sleep for one second in between. But while it is running, we can still do things on the main thread because uh, the main thread is basically the thread that runs the Jupyter Notebook. And uh, whenever you execute a cell, the main thread will take this um, and run the code in there. So, um, yeah, we can still do things in the Jupyter Notebook while this uh, thread, this other thread is running. So, yeah, let's start this. And we can see that now it starts printing uh, a high mark. And then um, if I just execute this cell here, you can see that hello was printed as well. And this came from the main thread. So we just um, basically, yeah, we... Um, interrupted the other thread and um, printed hello in between using the main thread. And now it has finished. So yeah, it's done now with executing um, this 20 times. And just to show you this last cell down here as well, um, I will run this again. And then uh, this calls thread.join. And I have also talked about um, joining threads uh, before. So what this does is just um, it tells the main thread, so the current thread that is executing this line, to uh, wait until this other thread is done. So thread.join will wait um, until yeah it has finished printing Ohai mark 20 times. And after that it will print done. And uh, yeah, this will be done to show you that it only prints done after it finished printing uh, 20 times. So yeah, let's start this thread again and actually start. So we can still print the hello in between and it continues printing a high mark. Then if I execute the join, um, now it goes over to print in this cell uh, because it always prints in the cell that is being executed by the main thread. But uh, the main thread is currently waiting for this other thread to finish. And now it finished and it printed done. So the join waited for the thread here until it was done and then continued executing. All right, so now let's go to more, um, yeah, more useful example, but still not really useful because it's a toy example. So um, yeah, we'll create this 
countdown function. And um, yeah, it's not really useful at all. It's just um, counting down from 1 million and then saying that it finished. So yeah, it's really, un uh, it's really useless. Um, but it's just to show you how different threads could um, yeah, execute this function and uh, how the multi-threading works. So let's create this function. And here um, we will do everything on one thread, on the main thread, and um, just check if our multi-threading is really um, equally as slow as the main thread. So um, let's see how long this main thread uh, takes to count down from 1 million five times. And this took um, yeah, 0.28 seconds. So let's see uh, what happens if we create threads for that. And we do it in a similar way. We also have this range from 0 to 4. Um, and then we yeah, append a new thread to this, uh, this threads list in each iteration and then we start the last thread in this list which is always the thread that we just added and then in the end we just join all the threads to make sure that we um, take the time after the threads have finished counting down otherwise it would just um, yeah keep counting down in the background and the main thread would have finished executing this so just starting threads and um, yeah, this would be much faster, but we actually want to count how long it takes until um, yeah, it has counted down. So let's see, uh, this actually took longer. So yeah, this was kind of expected. This took uh, 0.39 seconds. And um, we could have expected that it takes equally as long, but um, yeah, it took quite a bit longer. And this is due to the overhead. And as I said, Threads have less overhead than th than processes, but they do still have overhead. And this is what you can see here. The threads, um, so creating a thread and joining a thread and uh, making sure to like spawn the resources um, in your process takes some time. And yeah, this will just be represented in um, the time that it took to count down. But uh, yeah, this amount of um, yeah, time that is used to instantiate the thread can be negligible um, when you have like a program that just creates a thread in the beginning and then uh, continues with both threads uh, during the execution time then it doesn't really matter um, and even if you create lots of threads on a regular basis um, then it can still sometimes make sense to use threads instead of just using like a sequential uh, program with a single thread. Okay, um, now let's see a different example and this time we will sleep instead of counting down and uh, we have this sleep function which just sleeps, sleeps for two seconds and then prints um, yeah, the number um, of this index um, has finished sleeping. So let's see how this does um, when we are using one thread. And um, yeah, we do this five times again. So we expect this to take 10 seconds because we are sleeping five times and two seconds each. So this will take 10 seconds. And yep, yeah, it did. It took 10.009 seconds. And um, yeah, this is not exactly 10 seconds because um, yeah, it always takes some time to um, set variables, Python is not the most efficient language, so there is some overhead in the Python code as well. And um, the the time function is not the most accurate one. So this is not exactly 10 seconds, but a little bit more. Um, but that's fine, it's close enough to 10 seconds that, um, that we don't care about the rest. So let's now do this in uh, multi-threading. And we're basically doing the same as as in the countdown example, but this time we're just uh, saying target equals sleep instead of target equals countdown. And now this uh, will do the same thing. It will sleep five times for two seconds, but it only took two seconds instead of 10. And this is because sleeping um, does not refer to the CPU sleeping, but to a thread sleeping. And um, yeah, when a thread sleeps, then it's not doing anything 
and this means that even in Python, multiple threads can sleep at the same time. And uh, yeah, for that reason, we can have five threads just sleeping at the same time, and uh, they will all take two seconds from the same time on. So in total, it will just take two seconds for five threads to sleep two seconds each. But what you can notice is that now the order is not right anymore. So before in the sequential um, call, we had um, 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, which is um, just the indices of the for loop. But this time, um, the threads had different um, ending times. So um, the, the threads finished in order 1, 0, 3, 2, 4. And uh, yeah, this order is really random. It depends on yeah, lots of things, things going on uh, in the background of your computer, um, other programs that might also want to use the CPU at the same time. And uh, yeah, it's just not really um, for human graspable um, or understandable why this certain order now occurred. Um, yeah, there are lots of different processes playing around with the CPU. So um, this is the reason why the the order is now different. So you can't really depend um, on the order of your thread calls anymore. Um, and yeah, this is what I wanted to show regarding multi-threading. Uh, multi In the next video, I will talk about multi-processing.